you take the antiderivative for a problem that is not integratable otherwise. So we call this the U substitution rule. There are many, many sheets for it. So you have an indefinite or definite integral. So a definite integral is an integral that has bounds and yields a numerical answer. An indefinite integral is an integral that has no bounds and gives a family of functions. We can represent these by what we call slope fields. We're going to learn about slope fields next week. These are also where we have our plus c's. So anytime you have an indefinite integral, you get a plus c. So we can use differentiation to antiderive. That's what we saw with the fundamental theorem of calc. So if we had a integral such as u to the negative one, we memorized that that was the natural log of u. We knew that that was the natural log of u because we knew that the derivative of ln u was equal to one over u. So that only works, and this is why there are absolute values, when the value of u is greater than zero, because you cannot take the natural log of a negative value. So that's the connection between derivatives and antiderivatives. They are inverses of each other. If you have one, then you can take the derivative. If you have the derivative, then you can antiderive. So again, fundamental theorem of calc, that's where we came from. So where are we going? Why is that kind of important? Well, what happens if that u value is something other than just a u? What happens if it's like an x plus 3? Or what happens if we have x squared plus 3 on bottom and x on top? Well, then we need to use what we call u sub. And that's what we're going to lead into today. So it says, is the anti-differentiation of f of u the same as the anti-differentiation of f of u dx? So does it matter if you have f of u du versus f of u dx. So remember that du represents the width or the chain of width. So we had our differentials. So differentials are those dy dx, dy du's, etc. So we have here for our differential, this would become dx, du, dx. So the derivative of u with respect to variable x, or u prime, like y prime, is equal to to x, and then if we're trying to find du, then we would move over dx. So du is equal to 2x dx. So f of u for the function u du would look like the integral of x squared times substituting 2x dx for du versus if we integrated f of u 
of Q be this way. Saying that U is equal to U cubed. So you can see that if we integrate it this way, we end up with the integral of 2x cubed dx, whose antiderivative is 2x to the fourth over 4. If we integrate it this way, then we end up with 1 fourth u to the 4 plus c. So we don't quite have the same problem. And then if you replace u with x squared, we get 1 fourth x squared to the 4 plus c, which becomes 1 fourth x to the plus c. So again, not equal to each other. So the mixing and matching of multiple variables does not work. So you have to realize or recognize that you cannot integrate or anti-derive with mixed variables. We have to ensure that if we have f of u, then it is du. If we have f of x, then it is dx. So that leads to our u substitution. If we're going to use u, then we have to replace everything with u. We're going to use x, then everything needs to be x. So the idea behind the substitution rule is that it allows us to make complicated Integral simpler. This is the reverse of the chain rule. So we have sine of x squared and 2x dx. We have x squared and the square root of 5 plus 2x cubed dx. So again, what you should notice is here, every variable is x. So these are all good. What we have to do is then change or manipulate them so that there are no x's at all. So you have to start with all the same variable and integrate with all the same variable. So when we look at these, what we want to do is take the complicated part and replace it with something simpler. So you are going to take the complicated inside of the square root and make it simple. So we want to take the square root and simplify that. So we know how to take the square root of a variable. We know how to anti-derive the square root of a variable. So what we're going to do is say that u is equal to 2x plus 1. So now I've replaced the complicated with something simple. But I don't have dx, and I cannot take the antiderivative with a dx. So what I have to do is say, okay, well, the derivative of u is du dx. The derivative of 2x plus 1 is 2. <coughs> du is equal to 2. dx, but I don't have a 2 in my problem, I only have a dx in my problem. So we need to divide by 2, 
so that du divided by 2 equals the x. Okay, just like I replaced the 2x plus 1 with a u, we're going to replace the dx with 1 half du. Then you're going to manipulate clean it up and say, okay, well, the one half can go out in front. The square root of u is really like u to the one half. Well, now I know how to take the antiderivative of u to the one half du. All the variables are the same. So I get one half. Antiderivative of u to the one half becomes u to the one half plus one, which is three halves divided by 3 halves, which is really like multiplying by 2 thirds. It is an indefinite integral, so I have my plus C. Now we clean it up and re-replace the U with an X. So if the problem started with X, we want our final answer to be X. So one half times two thirds, your twos cancel. So I get one third. I don't want to leave my problem with u. I want to replace the u with what u is equal to, which is two x plus one. So I get one third two x plus one to the three halves plus c. So we essentially substitute twice. You substitute the first time to take away the complicated, take away the dx, replace it with du, then the final end, you replace the u back with the x. So the antiderivative of the square root of 2x plus 1 is 1 third 2x plus 1 to 3 halves plus c. So you can see how it's the chain rule in the sense that you have something to make power, and you have to take into account the derivative of the inside versus the outside. Okay. So again, you look for what is complicated. So what's complicated is what's inside a square root, what's inside a trig function, inside your lns. So in this case, my u value is going to be 1 minus 4x squared. Now we go back, we take our derivatives. Derivative of 1 is 0. Derivative of negative 4x squared is negative 8x dx. Then you look at the problem and you decide what do you have and what don't you have. So in that problem, I have 8, or I have x and dx. What I don't have is that negative 8. So we need to solve for x dx. So we're going to divide both sides by negative 8. So I get that negative 1 8 du equals x dx. So I'm going to replace that x dx with negative 1 8 du. Anytime you have a constant, you can put it in front of your integral over and again, we said the u was 1 minus 4x squared, so it's going to get over the square root of u. Now we know anytime we have a single square root or denominator, we can bring it up as a negative power. So it's really like negative 1 8 the integral of u to the negative 1 half du. The 
reverse power rule says you add one, divide by that new exponent, so you get negative one eighth u to the positive one half divided by one half, which is really like multiplying by two. Plus c. So again, you don't have to have equal signs as you work through this problem, but you want to make sure you show the fluidity, so you need to write everything straight down. You can put arrows to indicate you're moving this way, but you need to show where you're going and where it came from. There has to be some sort of concise order. Negative one-eighth times two is negative two-eighths, or negative one-fourth. Replace that u back with what it was, square root 1 minus 4x squared. And then again, you're not plugging in numbers, so we need a plus c. Remember that negative 1 8, even though it's technically multiplying to that c, since we don't know what c is, negative 1 8 times a number is still just a number, since c represents an arbitrary number. We're not adding coefficients to it. It's not a variable. It's a number. So you don't multiply that negative one eighth for the C value. Make sense? Okay. Another use of So what you should notice here is I have a square root I also have variables outside that square root, but this is the first time that what's inside and what out is outside don't match, quote unquote. So what I mean by that is what's inside is one plus x squared. If you take its derivative, You get 2x dx. But the problem itself has x to the fifth. So, yes, I can divide this by 2. I can take one of those x's away. I can put the u under the square root. The one half out in front. But I'm still stuck with x to the fourth. I can't have x's and u's. I cannot have x's and u's. So what I have to do is take my u value that I have, and it's 1 plus x squared, and I need to manipulate it again so we get rid of the x to the fourth. So u is 1 plus x squared. So then it's fair to say that x squared is u minus 1. I haven't manipulated anything. I just moved the negative to the other side. Well, x squared is u minus 1. x squared squared is x to the fourth. So u minus 1 squared is x to the fourth. So again, if I took this and I squared it, I get x to the fourth, <coughs> which means that this squared So I have one half u to the one half times u minus one squared times the But 
But again, I have something inside complicated a square. So you have a choice. You can either foil d minus one squared and then distribute u to the one half, or you have the u sub again. And you would have to say that w is equal to u minus 1, and then dw is equal to du, and again, you would have to get rid of the u to the 1 half. So it's really just a matter of what you think is easiest. If x to the 4 is u minus 1, then you could say it's u squared minus 2u plus 1, because u minus 1 times u minus 1 is u squared minus u minus u plus 1. So you have 1 half u to the 1 half u squared minus 2u plus 1 du. Personally, I would rather foil the double u sub but either is fine. Now you have to distribute that u to the one half. A power times a power gets added, so one half plus two becomes two to the one half, two and one half rather, or five halves. Minus 2u to the 3 halves plus u to the 1 half du. So this is where algebra really starts to come into play with calc. We haven't really done much calc. Everything we've done is algebra. Manipulating the calc to something we can calculate. So now I can take the antiderivative of u to the 5 halves, 2u to the 3 halves, and u to the 1 half, because they're all just your first power rules. So I have 1 half being multiplied to all of those. So u to the 5 halves becomes 2 sevenths u to the 7 halves. So we add one, divide by that power, minus two times adding two to the numerator, you get u to the five halves times two fifths. Plus Two thirds u to the three halves, all plus c, and all multiplied by a half, and replacing u with one plus x squared for our final answer. So we're going to substitute and distribute at the same time. So a half times two sevenths is one seventh. 1 plus x squared to the 7 halves minus a half times 4 fifths. So 4 divided by 2 is 2. So minus 2 fifths. 1 plus x squared to the 5 halves plus a half times 2 thirds, which is 1 third. 1 plus x squared to the 3 halves plus c. So not all u cells are as simple as the first couple. They get kind of messy. They get gross, essentially. Again, it's a way to simplify 
a problem we otherwise could not simplify. We also can look at u sub problems with numbers. We can also look at u sub problems with numbers. So how does looking at a u sub problem with a number change what we're doing? Well, it changes the fact that you go from a general, do you have this on the next page? I know, but honestly, like, I want to, what is zero to you at? I would, your homework doesn't have any numbers, so I'm going to say numbers for tomorrow. I thought I reorganized all of mine. Okay. So I think I must have just, like, missed the leading or moving those two slides. Sorry. All right, so we have x cubed cosine x to the fourth plus 2. So we have trig functions that also work with u sub. So what you'll notice is you have stuff outside and stuff inside. So remember, like, our books kind of annoyed me because sometimes they had trig functions with stuff inside. And I'm like, you don't know how to do that yet. Ignore that trig problem or treat it like an x. So here, now, we're going to finally learn how to do those trig problems that have something inside for their angle. So you're going to take that x to the fourth plus 2 and make it a u. Then you're going to take the derivative of that You're going to look at your problem and say, okay, what do I have? What do I not have? So I have x cubed in the x. It doesn't matter that the x cubed is in front, because remember that all of these problems are multiplication, and technically multiplication is commutative. So even though that x cubed's out in front, you can think of it as being multiplied by that dx. So we notice that I have x cubed dx. Well, here I have x cubed dx. So what doesn't belong? What don't I have? I don't have the 4. So what you do is divide that 4 over to be with the du. So that 1 fourth is going to come in to my antiderivative. So you look for what you have. Divide away what you don't have. So that one fourth is a constant. I like to write that out in front. I'm going to integrate the cosine of u du. Well, now that's easy. Antiderivative of cosine is sine. Remember, size derivative is cosine. So you get one fourth the sine of u plus c. But again, I didn't start with a u, so I can't end with a u. So we say one fourth the sine of x to the fourth plus two plus c. Think about taking the derivative of that. Derivative of sine is cosine. It would be cosine x to the fourth plus two because the inside stuff. And then what did you do? Chain rule said that if you had a trig function with something complicated inside, you multiply and divide that something complicated. So derivative of sine became cosine complicated would have been 4x cubed. And then you notice that the 4 and the 1 before cancel each other, thus giving you x cubed cosine x to the fourth plus 2. So you can always check your u sub answers, see if you get back to the original, using the chain rule from derivatives. I'll tell you guys we can finish. Okay. Same idea. We know that the derivative of tan 
a secant tan and the secant or the derivative of secant is secant tan. So we know what we're going to look for for our antiderivative. The problem is that our angle is two theta, not just theta. So we say, okay, u is equal to two theta. The derivative of two theta is two d theta. I don't want that two with my d theta. So I'm gonna divide it to the other side, which means I'm gonna bring it out as a constant. Theta becomes du, two theta becomes u, and again, what is the antiderivative of secant theta or secant u tan u? Well, that's secant so I have one half secant u plus c or one half the secant of two theta plus c. All right, we're going to stop there. I have a worksheet that's called new sub indefinite integrals number two. You're going to do the problems on the front and the back. And then tomorrow, we will continue our investigation of these types of integrals. Oh, I'm not thinking. And look at you some. Yeah.